Oh, hello and uh, welcome to Esoterica. Uh, today I am uh, so honored to be joined by uh, organized crime author Peter Edwards. Uh, Peter Edwards and his co-author uh, Louise Nahara, Nahara, I hope I got that right, uh, mm -hmm. recently published a book called The Wolf Pack. And um, the Wolf Pack, the millennial mobsters who brought chaos and the cartels to the Canadian underworld. And it is a, a shocking and fascinating read. So, so welcome, Peter, and thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. So, uh, wow, the Wolf Pack. So this opened my eyes in ways I, I actually wish it hadn't, because uh, now I know a bit too much about the cartels and, and their involvement in Canada. But... Uh, it sparked lots of questions. So, so let's start from the beginning. Um, you met your co-author, who is uh, of Mexican origin and has covered the cartels as well for uh, many, many years. Uh, how did that relationship come together? Um, he was in the newsroom, and he um, someone introduced us. And at, at first, I thought, um, oh, what an interesting guy. But then I thought our worlds are too far apart. Like I thought it's really interesting, but I won't have a clue what he's talking about and kind of vice versa. And then there was a murder in Toronto on College Street and it brought both sides together. Like we had a, a murder where um, uh, his half was needed to explain the extreme violence and the uh, the theatrical violence, which is something we generally don't get up here. And then... Um, the criminals involved were from all these different um, different groups, and so that was where, where I came in. Right. I mean, it's fascinating. So, I mean, you say theatrical. What, what do you mean by theatrical murder? Uh, they kill somebody, but they don't just kill them. They have to kill them with an audience. So this the right. person who was killed on College Street was watching a, a soccer game on an outdoor door patio with 200 people sitting around him, and he was right under a big screen TV. There was another guy who was shot to death in a really nice hotel where the American women's soccer team was there. And so the American women's soccer team was tweeting about how terrible it was. The, um, it sounds odd, but the early, the stuff I've been doing before this, you'd have someone shot leaving a social club, leaving a stag, leaving a, um, a restaurant, but it would, it would be sort of one person isolated walking across the parking lot. Um, mm -hmm. But these ones, they needed a crowd and they could have killed those people in a lot more discreet locations, but they needed to be seen. Mm -hmm. and, and so, and this is a fascinating thing. Uh, so why, why do they need to be seen? I mean, what, what is the message? Is it, is it fear? Is it acknowledgement? Is it uh, like, what, what, is, what is it trying to tell us? I think they're trying to be noticed by the cartels. And so the cartels right. are, are kind of new to Canada. And so they, they need to show that they're a big deal and they need to do it quickly. And the cartels do this sort of thing. I mean, we actually, when we're going through statistics, it was unnerving, but there is an actual government statistic for beheadings. And so, I mean, you've already killed the guy, but why chop off his head? It's to make a statement. Um, it, and they, oh, there's one Canadian who was killed down there and there were people hanging under a bridge. And so you hang them under a bridge so people see it and you're, you're yeah. kind of staking turf. And so, um, um, it's sort of odd, but it, um, a lot of media theory and Marshall McLuhan, it's sort of when there's a, when there's a void, you have to be loud and, right. um, you know, that's how you establish your identity. And so mm -hmm. a couple loud killings and all of a sudden you're on the map. Okay. Well, that brings us to, uh, this concept of the wolf pack. So can you, um, I mean, it's the title of your book, and I mean, I, I love the imagery of the of this gun. I don't know who came up with that, with the, the smoking gun and the wolf's mouth, but I mean, who is the wolf pack? Um, it's, it's interesting because it's um, a multi-ethnic gang, and so there's, there's and it's um, from across Canada, and there's no one street you can say they're from. It's mm -hmm. mostly millennial. It's um, internet based. It's sort of, you know, going back to Marshall McLuhan, it's the global village. Like uh, with right. the, the organized crime I wrote about before, you could point to um, a street um, like John Papalia, the Hamilton gangster, that was Railway mm -hmm. Street, um, Hell's Angels, and Satan's Choice. You could say Simcoe Street, South and Oshawa um, for some of them. These guys, you can't really say where they're from, and they move all over the place. It's but they're but there's always the connection of encrypted internet. Mm -hmm. But I mean, and so this is the, the interesting part. So when we think about, you know, I mean, 
talking about Marshall McLuhan and the media and our perception of, of organized crime, you know, we think of um, various different ethnic groups that have that, you know, uh, that trust that ethnic groups have amongst each other and the history and the background. I mean, so you're saying there's a, this uh, disparate group of uh, criminals that come together through various internet based organizations and how do they develop trust and how do they join and what, like, how does this even form? Um, it, it's interesting because they're um, the, a lot of the, inter there's a guy Moses Naim who writes about the internet and how it affects people. And it talks about intense relationships that don't last very long. Mm -hmm. And so um, that that's what this is. And so it's odd that now um, a pe since the books come out, I've connected with someone who is, was a character in the book who was shooting at the wolf pack, and now he's turned on his group and he's happy to talk about them. There's a another character in the book, Nick Nero, who kind of looks like a, a murderous buffoon, and he, one of his friends. I thought he'd be really angry at me, and he was laughing his head off about Nero and more than happy to tell me stories about him. And so, you just don't have the um, the loyalty, the, lo the loyalty is sort of the greed of the next deal. And as soon as the deal is almost made, then you can shaft that person and move on to a deal beyond that. And so it's um, a very short term loyalty. So these people are reaching out to you eager to talk to you about, I mean, their criminal dealings. So, so why? I mean, why? Why would they? I mean, the, why, what happened to the secretive? You know, I mean, don't they want to keep some of the secret? I mean, it's almost as if they're flaunting this information. It's really weird in my job because I used to work a lot harder and get a lot less. And now right. now people people contact me. I mean, it's just, it's just bizarre. And I, the, the why part, um, I don't want to use the phrase dumb guy stuff, but but right. I could. You know, like there's a lot of it is um, I was in on that, too. Um, right. I did that, too. I um, you got most of it, but not everything. Um, I'm not a monster. Yes, I did mm -hmm. paralyze that person. But no, I'm not a monster. Um, mm -hmm. I'm basically a nice guy. And then the, the sort of the paranoia idea, if um, well, there was one one attack where they just opened fire on a on a full car. And so they six people inside and a woman was paralyzed. A guy was killed. Another guy was almost killed. But then uh, someone who organized the attack explained to me why they did that. And it's because people in that group had murdered someone from their group. And then they were taunting one of the brothers, like one of the, they killed someone. Then they were taunting his brother saying, where are you now? Where are you without your big brother? And so the level of, of hatred just built up. And once you become paranoid, you, um, it's your absolute worst self. And then when you get them away from the group, they uh, they seem like the guy who, um, you know, fixes fixes your car or waits on you at Canadian right. Tire. Right. Except that they kill people. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's, sort of, it's sort of an odd ordinariness when they're not doing extraordinary things. Like it's a, it's a weird, right. weird thing. Right, right. I mean, that's actually what something I, I drew from the book is, you know, these are, these do seem like very, Ordinary people, I mean, and, and there's uh, I just an, an abundance of even just text messages that just could be casual text messages, really, except that in the text they're plotting uh, killings and, you know, drug deals and, and the like. So, I mean, how did you even get it? How did you even get a hold of all these texts? Um, where we got them, they don't they they don't want it said. Okay, so, fine. Okay. So um, um, they, this is there was an odd book to do because usually people want their name in it, and a lot of times right. people want their name on the cover. This one, people are asking, you know, please assure me that my name won't be in it. You like don't don't put me in right. the acknowledgments, and right. so um, it's sort of an odd feeling that way. Um, the um, there was one mess, um, one exchange that really got me where one guy was setting up a woman's clothing store, a really high end one in, in Montreal, where yeah. the belts the belts were like thousands and thousands of dollars. And then the other guy wanted three murders carried out. And he oh. um, and so the guy who um, was setting up the, the clothing store, he was the guy who had access to the hitman. And so he's the one who would send him off on, on jobs. And the guy charged quite a bit for a killing. And so they it's almost you know, you don't want to waste your money on just killing just anybody. And right. he he asked for three murders and um, 
or the other guy kept talking about belts. And so they're going back and forth in this conversation. And then the guy who wanted the murders got interested in the belts. And so he started talking belts and then, and then it was like, yeah, we can get around to the murders, but you'd think like, if you were from a different planet, do you think that somehow murders and belts go together? And the, and the guy who, um, the guy kept trying to get back to the belts. Like he's more than happy to do the murders, but he was just focused on belts for the moment. It, 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 there's a lot of odd stuff like that. No one was, there wasn't the why, or there wasn't the, um, oh, his mother's going to cry, or does he have kids? Or it was just, oh my God, I've got to order these belts. You know, can you just let me get on with that? And right. just a real, real oddness. And the um, uh, the guy who wanted the murders carried out, he would go to spas, you know, he and he'd, get massages and he'd get stressed out uh, like he'd he was quite quite pampered when he when he wasn't going around um you know getting people shot right i mean it, it is remarkable i remember that episode about the belts and you know it, it was very particular about the price range as well uh you know it had to be in the 10 like 10 to twelve thousand, <laughs> not the forty thousand dollar range and um and i thought well i mean Okay, I mean, it, it was very bizarre. I mean, so, so you have this this wolf pack, and and so the where's the name come from? Actually, the wolf pack. Um, they just they just thought it up because they thought it sounded cool. Like they just yeah. um, <laughs> That's really um there's some big yeah there are some sports teams in the states called wolf pack, and so yeah. someone would have just been watching a football game and heard wolf pack and just thought, oh wow, you know what, you know that's kind of neat, but they. It sort of makes sense in a way because it it, it is a pack. Like you mm-hmm. have to, as a writer, decide on who do you consider the leader and who are people asking questions to because there are no real titles. With um, mm-hmm. with the old mafia or Hell's Angels, they're actual titles. I mean, the Hell's Angels, they make it really easy for you because they actually wear their title on their vest. Like they announce who they are and right. they announce it really loudly and then they their title is right there. With mm-hmm. these guys, um, I mean, they all it could be any of them. You just have to see which one's getting more respect and which one um, um, takes the least abuse. Like if there, there, there's one of them who um, you could not insult anyone in his group. And he, right. he pointed out that my men don't do that. And he said, they, they know that I killed their families. And so that's upping the level of violence again, even mob guys in Canada just stay away from the families and hell's angels. Yeah. Don't, don't do that sort of thing. I'm not making a case for them being, um, big public benefactors, but there's certain <laughs> rules that, that they used to have. Right. I mean, so, I mean, so there's the Hells Angels and there's the traditional, uh, you know, as we just, you describe it, mafia. And so how does the wolf pack, uh, this new wolf pack uh, intersect with those established criminal entities? Um, it takes a lot of patience if you're in those groups to get to the top. Like there are a lot of old guys, um, you know, way up there who can decide on your fate. And with, um, oh, say if a criminal goes to prison and he gets out, then he's not all that internet savvy because he hasn't been Googling for a while. And so okay. like, they're not they're not masters of technology, some of the old guys when they get out of prison and um, uh, they, their wives would be showing them how to set up their cell phone, that sort of thing. And so the um, younger ones, there's a lot of impatience with um, the mafia. Vito Rizzuto, who was Canada's top mafia guy until 2013 when he died, he he didn't get the top job until he was 66 years old. And his dad right. was still kind of hanging around behind him and he was in his late 80s. And so it takes patience a lot of times in mob groups to to reach the top. With the, with the wolf pack, you just make the right connection in Mexico and off you go. Like, you know, someone with a with a trucking business and you, you hook up with someone down there and all of a sudden you're off and running. Right. Right. Uh, okay. So, I mean, and so these are millennials, so let's say they're in their thirties, correct? I yeah. Twenties and thirties. Like the, 20, the smartest, most efficient 30s. one was mid thirties. Yes. He was, he's almost uh, too young for the millennials. Like I guess he right. just scraped in there. So, I mean, I, I mean, the, the fascinating thing about this group, so you call them very, they're very tech savvy. But they're also um, ethnically diverse, which we touched on earlier. Um, I mean, so not only are they, are they ethnically diverse, I mean, you know, there's one uh, one of the characters you mentioned who's even, it almost sounds like a um, made-for-TV movie. I mean, there's uh, ethnically diverse mobsters, you know, there's uh, one in a wheelchair. And it's, you know, these are things that we would not imagine. I mean, what does that say about crime and and actually 
wokeness, I say, maybe even. I mean, <laughs> yeah. can anyone be a criminal and it's really okay? I mean, what, what is it? Is it, what does it say? I think you just touched on it. I mean, anyone can be a criminal and it's, um, uh, it's more greed. I mean, like, like being woke doesn't mean you're not greedy. And, right. um, and a lot of it's playing with terms. Like if yeah. you're, if you're sort of bad at the core, then, you know, you might be on the surface saying all these, these wonderful things that, that are politically correct, but you're still not a nice person. I mean, it sounds kind of, kind of basic, but, um, um, uh, it, it, it was odd. I mean, there was just a level of cruelty in that group that was off the charts, but but we didn't see any ethnic slurs. We didn't see any, any um, um, anything that, that wouldn't pass, you know, the sort of, you know, U of T grad school, um, right. you know, <laughs> kind of sniff test. Right. Fascinating. And um, now let's talk, I mean, the, I guess the one uh, demographic that's possibly not so well represented uh, is women. I mean, there's, you, you know, you reference, I believe, Nero's fiance, wife, uh, several times throughout the book and, and her intelligence. Um, I mean, are there are, are there women in the wolf, wolf pack? I mean, can they join the wolf pack or is this a boys only group? Um, there are women profiting from it. Like there is yeah. a there is something about guys where we we like our own clubs, but but there are women definitely profiting. And there was a, um, I guess you call her a hit person who was working against them, who, according to um, someone who was in a group called the United Nations, she killed at least three people. And so she, and apparently she was on the far end of, of angry, like she was extremely angry at a lot of people. And so um, they could turn her loose and nobody expected it. Uh, apparently once she got on an elevator with someone and, you know, it wasn't a good ride for the guy. Really, just like that, just something. Yeah, that's like, um, well, she or she she'd keep a grudge pretty well, but then she also was um, uh, from a family that a lot of bad things had happened to. It's mm -hmm. one thing when you it sounds corny, but if you're violent, people will be violent back to you. I mean, because they're right. afraid of you. If people are afraid of you, they're going to want to shoot you, rather right. than you know give you a nice right. hug and buy you a hot chocolate. Right, which is how we, you know, Canadians think of ourselves. And I, I guess this is, you know, it's kind of blew my mind a little bit in in that so much of this violence is happening in Canada. And I mean, you know, we have, you know, the distinction of being that stereotype when we travel of, you know, good natured Canadians and, you know, nothing bad happens here. Well, of course, we know that not to be true. Um, but, uh, you know, this, this book kind of really shows that it's, you know, there's been major headway in terms of criminal activity and organized criminal activity in Canada. Um, like, I mean, you've been on the crime beat for like a long time. I mean, what, like, what, where do you see the trajectory of going? I mean, um, a long time ago, I got to um, know a guy who, Doug Jaworski, who worked with the Medellin cartel, and he was a pilot, and then he became sort of a technical advisor, and he helped them plan routes of where to fly drugs. Mm -hmm. And um, the they had been bringing them up through Florida, but then that became so corrupt, it was even bad for the criminals. I mean, you just don't know who to pay off, and it's it's um, you're being watched too much, and so right. it's almost expected drugs will come through. And so the idea was, why don't you bring them up to Canada and then drop them back down again? Mm -hmm. And Montreal's, I think, 385 miles from New York City, so it's not that big of a deal if you get them to Canada to sell some up here and then then dump them in New York. And back then, the big deal was get as many drugs as you can into New York. And so they um, they started flying them into New Brunswick and the Maritimes, where they just didn't think there would be um, uh, much surveillance and really high-level policing. And where one of the jails actually didn't even have armed guards. And so they caught a couple of cartel guys um, from the Medellin cartel. And then the joke was that if they escaped, they'd shout stop or I'll shout stop again. Like they hadn't, they didn't right. have any guns. And they had a, a cartel right. hit team that was like a military group. And so um, it's been going on for a while. Like, and then they realized there's a good Canadian market as well. And so you, yeah. you don't just have to bring them down there. A lot of... Um, a lot of it comes to um, through Chicago, which is pretty close to us. But it's um, right. it's a phenomenal shipping si um, city. Like it's just a um, a transportation hub, and so a lot of drugs are warehoused there and then brought in here through through trucks. Mm -hmm. Well, I, and I mean, do, is I guess the question is like, is is crime on the rise here? Like, do you see a future? Uh, like, I mean, organized crime. Do you see a future in which you know there are, 
are more hits happening in public restaurants like the ones you describe in the book? Like, is this something, um, will, th will this change the way Canadians think about ourselves as, you know, a wholesome, safe place for to raise families? I mean, where is um, this going? I know there's certain restaurants that I wouldn't sit too close to the next table. Like I, like it probably won't happen, but sort of thing. And um, right. uh, there's one nice restaurant in downtown Toronto where there've been two hits and they're not connected. And so it's right. sort of, if you go for a good meal, you're probably going to stay longer. Like right. it's not, it's not a fast food place where you just get your food in a bag and out you go. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's that. I think, um, I think the big thing to watch in the big barometer is how much corruption is there because you can't really have this stuff without corruption. And so mm -hmm. um, like now looking at the tow truck industry, what bothers me is right. more than half dozen police have been charged. Like I expect um, people to do criminal things. Um, but I, I hope I'm hoping that they're not wearing uniforms. Like that's when it becomes a problem or um, someone um, oh, like they, the, with the wolf pack, we found that they didn't have much trouble getting passports. I mean, that really bothers me, you know, that you right. can, um, that's the sort of, there was one woman who worked for Toronto police and she uh, lost her job and got a little bit of jail time, but um, her information helped lead to three murders. Like if you find out, if you know where the person lives, that makes it a lot easier. Um, right. um, I wrote on the weekend about a guy in witness protection who um, people figured out who he was. I mean, he wasn't all that discreet, but on the other hand, um, um, a long time ago, someone told me that you can't have real organized crime without corruption. You can have bandits right. and law breaking, but for the ongoing stuff where someone just defines themselves as a criminal and does it and buys a nice house out of it, um, uh, you need corruption. And um, the troubling thing is that almost every case we find corruption. And when we got into their encrypted texts, they were talking about people at airports and people at borders that, who were on their side. The um, new guy with the United Nations group talked about how someone in policing that um, they considered him to be in the pocket of one of their rivals. And so with they, they, they just, the other side just seemed to know way too much, way too quickly. Right. And that, that sort of stuff really, um, that's, that's what we've really got to worry about. And in, um, that's when you've lost the battle, like in, in Mexico, the, um, one thing that hit me working on the book was that how do you clean up the police when the cartels are going to hire the guys that you fire? Like if you fire someone for corruption, he's got a higher paying job at the cartel next, the next day if he wants it. Right, right. Yeah, that is, uh, that is very frightening. Sorry, can you elaborate on the trucking uh, incident? Because I think that, I mean, given the fact that the, the protests are still going on, I think that's really relevant. Uh, the trucking is, um, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty frightening because it, it's, it's very, very, very hard to catch drugs coming through in a truck. And it's, right. they, they know how to make, um, um, compartments that are x-ray pr x-ray proof and you don't need them to be all that big i mean drugs don't take all that much space if you send really right. pure stuff and if you also throw in some fentanyl to you know goose it up a bit more and would make it more dangerous but so um some of these guys are connected to legitimate trucking companies and so most of what's hauled is legitimate but then you just need right. a bit of drugs and the um what hit us working on the book was that during the pandemic, when things were tighter at the border, we assumed that it would be harder to get drugs into the country. And there was a um, initial sort of spike in the prices. And then they went back down to more or less normal because the drugs were still flowing. Like the, they, they weren't having a problem bringing in drugs. And some of these guys are, are very deep into the trucking industry. There's one guy who was um, uh, killed in Toronto who, when we talked about the need for attention, he was kicked out of a Raptor game for heckling LeBron James. So he was on oh, camera. Right. Yes. He got, of course, I yeah, remember that story, yes. Yeah, he got on the Jumbotron. He got kicked out of the game. He um, was happy about it. And he had fled BC because he was in trouble there. Like people were after him there. So he mm -hmm. came here and then what's one of the first things he does is get on the Jumbotron screaming at the greatest basketball player in the world. Like it's not right. discreet. Right. Um, but he, he ran a trucking business and he was driving either a Rolls Royce or a Bentley among other cars and living in a really nice place in Oakville. And he was 34 years old and a trucking, trucking guy. So there is some pretty bad stuff in the, not, I'm not saying all of the truckers, but right, it doesn't course. take all that much, you know, right. and it, these compartments don't have to be all that big. Right. Right. Um, I mean, yeah, it's interesting because you do say in the book that um, the pandemic did hit organized crime uh, a little bit. Like there was 
a bit of a setback. So you're saying that was very short lived? Yeah, I mean, there, and that kind of hit me because I thought sort of naively, you know, there'll be hard, it'll be harder to get drugs. Maybe people will even smarten up and get off drugs, you know, right. stop use, you know, that, that was just, um, didn't see that at all. It was just a slightly, right. there was almost a feeling of, um, uh, maybe it was hoarding or whatever. Maybe the criminals didn't realize they were quite so good. And they, and right. maybe they, but um, um, I, they, they did just fine moving in their drugs. Like they, mm. it didn't get, I mean, it is what they do. Someone told me that um, whether they're smuggling them before, you know, what's, what's different during a pandemic here, they're already doing a good job smuggling them. So, you know, why is it any tougher when, you know, the guy checking is wearing a mask? Right. I guess that's true. I guess that's, that's <laughs> absolutely true. Um, so uh, um, now, um, was there any, I mean, the book is, is incredibly researched, of course. Um, what, was there any major surprises either for you or, or for Louise? Uh, just, I think at the start, it was there was a feeling of are they coming and then by the time we finish the book it's no they're here like it's right. um i think it's that send in the clown song you could sing a right. cartel song to that like don't worry they're here like they're and they're killing people all over the place like when they want to they do it and they can contract out to another group and then the other group gets a better deal on drugs um also that um they really are good at what they do i mean there were a couple um, accountant type people in Mississauga who were were deported, but they would just keep an eye on people and they would mm -hmm. go around to where drugs are stored and make sure the place is tidy and they had nice ledgers and it was just like an accountant doing a um, a foreign posting and so they right. there was that the the level of testing I mean Canadian criminals they sort of think of I'm nasty I can be a criminal and these guys are more you know can you test drugs can you it's more of um almost like a mainstream business and so the right. there's one poor guy down in mexico working for the the wolf pack who was supposed to be testing the drugs and he was a car salesman like he didn't have a clue how to test them and he um i mean he makes it makes him quite easy to cheat and it makes everybody mad at him but if you're buying the drugs and you think you're buying 97 percent pure and you're buying 70 percent pure you've been cheated for quite a bit and they right. they actually had to dumb some of it down so the canadians could understand it like they they can ship cocaine, um, liquefy it, dump clothing or some cloth in it, and then send the clothing up and then take it back out of the clothing again. But the Canadians couldn't, some of them couldn't handle that. And if you're in on a deal with three other people, then you don't know, you know, if it's all smuggled up in some jeans, you know, how do you get it out of the jeans and make sure you aren't cheated? Right. Well, it's very complicated. Um, but I guess, yeah, I, I mean, you do mention that, uh, there's a real emphasis on like testing and accuracy in business. So the, these uh, these millennials uh, have some serious business business acumen. They're not just thugs, correct? Yeah, and the um, one thing I got from working on the book too that I, I learned from Louise is that here people can step out of crime. I mean, like I know I know of one guy who made a lot of right. money, bought a, bought a nice house, paid off everything, and then just calmed down and looked after his friends and just dropped off the radar and then he's not really a police priority anymore either. Like you have mm -hmm. after a while, everybody moves on. But with these guys, right. they're the cartels are at war with each other. And so right. some of the, some of the times when Canadians are killed down there, it's because they're working in a war zone. Like there's a city where are there two Canadians um, killed a couple of weeks ago. And that was in an area that four different groups want control of. And a lot of small groups are trying to have control of. And so, if you're in a war, you can't just say, oops, I quit, you know, leave me right. alone. And right. so um, there's a there's a lot more than just buying a nice house and getting a swimming pool. Like you're, you're worried that someone's going to hunt you down and kill you. And we're getting more of that in Canada. Like there was um, a family with five brothers and then a couple of them got murdered. And so then the feeling would be the other brothers are going to want to kill us now. And right. so you, you might as well kill them. Like right. it's sort of a... Um, uh, once you get paranoid and once people are, are really afraid of you, then they'll do really bad things to you without asking. And a lot of rules get changed. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it seems odd too, but like at the start of my career doing this stuff, um, where murders would take place, like it was generally somewhere dark and late at night. And then now if you check, a lot of the hits are done in driveways. 
And so they don't really care if the wife sees the body and uh, the kids see the body. And it's kind of a, even for pretty hardened criminals, it's a nasty way to end someone's life. But but now mm-hmm. it's just more of the thing to do. You just wait wait in the hedge and he, out, he comes out the door, shoot him. And, and you know, so what if the four-year-old sees the body? Right. Wow. Um, and I mean, actually, you, you do end the book uh, with a warning, uh, a warning quote saying that um, um, it's too late to retreat to a quieter time. And that, that really resonated with me. So, I mean, how do you think this is going to evolve moving forward? I mean, you know, those quieter times are gone. So, so what can we expect in the next five years? I might think for treatment or or for for a response to it, um, catching them at the border, like they just, like this sounds awful, but they're just too good at it. Like they're going to bring the drugs in anyway. They can do it all through the pandemic. I think um, drug treatment, that's something we can actually do that will improve lives. I think um, for some of them, um, domestic violence is actually, you know, why can people do really, really cruel things? A lot of them have seen terrible things happen to their mother. And so they, they get, pretty desensitized. Uh, one guy, um, he wasn't in the wolf pack, but he said that he saw his mother beaten so many times that he thought when I'm 17, this isn't going to happen anymore. I'm going to be the guy in charge. Mm-hmm. And so um, there are a lot of things we can do that way. Also with corruption, we've got to take it really, really seriously. Like it's not a small right. thing to um, to tap into a computer and check something out or to give someone a false passport or to help someone get, get through customs. It's... Um, uh, more tow truck stuff. I, I think really, really cracking down on corruption. I mean, we're paying police officers a lot of times six figures, and we should expect right. them to be just working for us, not the criminals too. And and good. It's funny because good cops, um, for sources, a lot there are good cops who are incredibly frustrated with cops they don't trust. Like I've been warned by police, don't talk to this guy. Uh, really? You know, watch out with that guy. And and I've even had people say your credibility is going to drop if you if we know you're talking to this guy and you're losing credibility with us. Wow. That's just incredible. Um, well, uh, Peter, this was hugely eye opening. I mean, what's, what's next for you? Is there another book up about the wolf pack or what, what's your next big topic that you're going to tackle? Um, I'm not supposed to say yet cause there's a co-author, but, it, but it's a, um, at least the first 90% is much happier. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I guess happy is good. Uh, happy for a crime writer is, uh, I don't know, unusual, but yeah, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll wait. Uh, yeah, this one's kind of moving out of crime. Like it's okay. like it's taking a, taking a break from the crime stuff for a bit. Well, I'm glad. I think you probably need a break from the crime. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much for your time. And uh, we look forward to reading more of your work. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed that All a lot. Right. Okay. Take care. Thank you, Peter. Bye, everyone. You too. Bye.